The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. In his name, welcome to the Parish Church of St Columba and to this online service of worship. It is good indeed to be able to welcome you to worship today. Let us prepare for the worship of Almighty God in silence. Let us worship God. from scattered lives to this sanctuary, seeking our place within community, searching for peace that the eternal gives, the healing presence of the Lord in our lives. We have gathered as one people. Let us pray. Divine love, present in the centre of our being, experienced in tender touch and loving glance, felt in the struggles of life, shared in lived experience. Holy God, calling us towards greater understanding, stills troubles, comforts hurts, touches our lives with hope. We have belittled love, betrayed trusts, failed in our compassion, we repeat destructive behaviours, yet hope for different outcomes. We are sorry and ashamed. We repent of all our wrongdoings and seek forgiveness for all that is past. God grant us pardon, time for amendment of life and peace in the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Eternal love, we see in Jesus' words and examples a path for us to follow in order to love one another and to love ourselves so that encouraged to act and understand in a new way, we can be true to our calling as God's people. Amen.
The reading from scripture today is taken from the Gospel of St John, chapter 20, reading from verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Amen. considered yourself a Christian. I wonder how long you've been attending church, any church, not just St Columba. How long have you been attending services, listening to sermons, singing hymns, giving your so be it to a prayer with the word Amen? How many times have you said the Lord's Prayer? How often you've volunteered to help out in a church where they're putting up and putting away tables or doing a baking or raising money or doing the flowers 
or visiting someone from the church community that is alone at home or in hospital. Of course, my starting question of how long have you been a Christian isn't really a fair one, is it? Especially if we are of the Scottish Presbyterian tradition. Many of us don't have a specific moment when we realised we were a Christian. For lots of us, it is a slow growing feeling that we would like to align ourselves to the values we see exemplified by Jesus. That we believe in something other, some force that guides or leads us or is experienced. Of course, you don't have to be a Christian to feel like that. It is less common now that people continue to go to the church in the same fashion that they were traditionally taken by their parents on a Sunday morning. And yet, when we talk to people out with the church, they frequently say that they are spiritual. Often, that's rapidly followed by, but I'm not religious. The spiritual but not religious is a well-known phrase in our society and it indicates that people are very open to something. They just aren't particularly keen on the religious institutions that they perceive hold the power of spiritual encounter. We recognise that our numbers in the national church are dwindling and too regularly we reach for the same solutions that haven't worked in the past. It is naive of us to expect that the strategies that worked 60 or 70 years ago in the heyday of the church to work for us now in our current world. Often we hear requests for more children to come to church when we all see the football pitches and tennis courts full of children doing extracurricular activities on a Sunday morning. Parents see these activities as having more value for their children than coming to a church. And it doesn't matter how good our Sunday schools are unless they can compete with a soft play party on a Sunday morning that allows their child to remain within their peer group, some people will simply not attend. If we could see the church as they do, I wonder what we would realise and what that realisation would make us think about our future. There are many great minds who have contemplated what our church future will look like. Karl Rahner being one of them. Rahner, a Jesuit theologian, once said, the Christian of the future will be a mystic or will not exist. Almost 40 years after Rahner's death, the will not exist part seems to be coming true faster than anyone would like. Is a mystical Christianity the key to a thriving renewal of the faith, not only in the future, but now? We are certainly not the only people in the world to wonder what is going to happen to our future in the church. Throughout human history, people have sought meaningful ways to relate to the divine force they felt present in their lives. Our 21st century world has different expectations. We live with the knowledge that scientific endeavour has brought us and we need to find a way to honour this in our faith traditions if we want to remain relevant and of value in our societies, to resonate with them in their lives. Many of our spiritual but not religious friends have found other ways to encounter the divine in their lives, in various spiritual practices. Meditation, chanting, breathing exercises, rituals, visualisation, affirmation and prayer 
are just some of the many ways to achieve this. In some branches of the church, there is apprehension about these practices, but they are far from new. And they are frequently to be found deeply embedded in the Bible stories we encounter each Sunday. Jesus was a man who embraced silence. He frequently withdrew from the crowds to be on his own, to pray and be with God. Jacob wrestled with God. He had a spiritual encounter that left him changed. Moses visualised God in the burning bush. Enoch walked with God faithfully until God took him away. Abraham entertained angels, giving them food as they rested under a tree. Paul was moved by the divine on his road to Damascus. Thomas saw the risen Jesus. These people had mystical experiences and knew God. Their individual experiences were not the same what holds them together is that they experienced God. They recognised God in that moment and they were profoundly changed. In John's Gospel, Thomas wasn't there when the rest of the disciples encountered Jesus that first Easter evening. The next time he is with the other ten, they tell him of their experiences and he understandably says that unless he sees for himself, he cannot believe. Thomas wants his own first-hand experience and he gets this later on. It is significant that in this scene, there is no condemnation of Thomas for his questioning and his desire to experience God. Thomas had a mystical experience in which he felt and knew God. The author of this gospel is clear. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. And the examples in John's gospel are so that we can understand and come to see God as lived out by Jesus, that through believing you may have life in Jesus' name. Many of us who consider ourselves relatively normal would likely claim that we've never had a mystical experience where we have met God. Author and theologian Marcus Borg suggests this is perhaps because we are not connected with our environment in quite the same way as our ancestors were. We are too connected to the internet. We no longer have the same interaction with silence or peace or the environment that generations of the past experienced. But also, our scientific age makes us sceptical of our mystical experiences. I would add too that our traditions of how we worship and how we have set up our churches and how we have perhaps been encouraged to encounter and understand God as being elsewhere, distant from us, have discouraged us. But I wonder if perhaps we have had a mystical experience. We simply haven't called it so. Who here has never been moved by a magnificent sunset or found peace in an empty church or found lightning inspiration in the conversation with a friend or felt profound contentment amidst family? Borg says, God is everywhere. We are in God like fish are in water. Now, of course, water is in the fish, but it is more important that the fish is in the water. 
The fish might not even know it is in the water until it is removed. If, as the mystics suggest, that God or the sacred can be experienced, God is not far off, but right here, all around us. When we talk of God, we don't talk of a supernatural being who may exist, but about a glorious, radiant, luminous mystery that is right here and sometimes glimpsed, sometimes experienced. If indeed our spiritual but not religious friends are seeking meaning in their spiritual journeys, what are we saying to them in our religious and faith lives? Is our responsibility as Christians not to look backwards all the time and to use the same old formula that no longer work, to instead look forward to and create new ways of engaging with seekers that shows our Christian tradition has lots of value for those on a spiritual journey. In our modern world, can we find ways to encourage others to know that God, the divine, is not the scary man with a white beard who lives in the sky and punishes us when we make mistakes? but rather that we are in God like fish are in water. When we change our thinking about our experience in God, we may become more open to and can sometimes glimpse the divine. Perhaps we can even have the courage to share that with others to empower them on their spiritual journey too. Amen. Let us pray. Spring flowers bringing joy, birds rearing their young, warming winds, lengthening days, all part of God's nature. We give thanks for family and friends, neighbours, the kindness of strangers, the company of pets, and all that lifts our mood. We pray for our Queen Elizabeth and all in authority and positions of power, that under their leadership there may be mutual respect, integrity and justice, desiring that all self-centred ambition is cleared, that our leaders are free to serve. We remember all who live with war, especially those involved in the conflict in Ukraine, and we pray for an end to terror and fear. We give thanks for the gifts of sight and insight, grateful that God is present in all our seeking, enabling us to see with eyes of faith, love and honesty. Whenever we have contact with those around us, may we be reminded of our calling to share God's love, that all experience the assurance of the eternal, which brings us through the darkest of days. We give thanks for all saints, 
martyrs and mystics, whose insights and teachings about God in our midst have stood the test of time, and who have opened eyes and ears to our bonding with the spirit of life and love. In silence, we bring our own prayers, needs, burdens and worries, laying them open to God. We call to mind those who have died and give thanks for each act of goodness in their lives. We lift up those who grieve, praying that they feel the comforting embrace of Christ in their sorrow. These prayers we offer in Jesus' name and whose words to his first followers we now say together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us all now and evermore. Amen.